Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, so we're going to talk about international business cycles a bit. Uh, so before we get into anything really particularly serious, I want to start with a little joke, right? Get us into this, right? So, so how many Fed economists does it take to change a light bulb? Right? Of course, just one, right? You need Jerome Powell, right? He, he holds the light bulb still, and the entire world revolves around him. Right? <laughs> international business cycles. Okay. <laughs> Right. I try to be relevant, even with my jokes. Uh, well, this is a topic, though, that uh, I've been thinking about for actually quite a while. I mentioned that I was a fellow here in 2004. Uh, the paper that I wrote while I was here, I think you can actually still find it online if you look, uh, was about the international transmission of business cycles. Right? So it's been a while that I've been thinking about this, although I, haven't, I didn't actually publish anything on it until very recently. Uh, there was a, I think it was maybe a, a little over a year ago, at the Austrian Economic Research Conference, uh, Drs. Block and Herbner presented a paper. Uh, is oh, I'm trying to read the exact title now. I should know since they brought me in as a co-author. <laughs> that is, uh, is the virus of macroeconomic intervention contagious? Right, and they're looking into this question. Right, is it possible right for a business cycle starting in one place right to infect right other countries nearby? Uh, okay, my students know that I tend to reveal way too much, right? Like, uh, thinking of Wizard of Oz, I'm the, I'm the wizard that's like pulling the curtain back, saying, hey, here's how everything works, right? So, so how that paper came about was a great story, because it starts at a Mises U, right? Uh, so at the end of the week, right, you may have the opportunity to take the oral exam. If so, congratulations on getting, on kind of passing that bar and qualifying for that, which means you're going to get to be grilled, right, by some set of faculty. Right? And in one of these sessions, Dr. Herbner asked the questions, well, suppose that you have right, two countries. Right? One of them has sound money. Let's say it's operating on a 100% reserve gold standard. Right? The other, though, is not on sound money, and it starts a credit expansion. Right? So will the credit expansion move right, from the country that's expanding credit to the one that has the sound currency? He asked the student this question, and the rest of the faculty on the panel thought, oh, that's an interesting question. Right? And so we asked him afterward, we said, so, so, so Jeff, we are on a first name basis with each other usually, right? like, so what's the answer to the question? Right? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, when we ask you the question, we might not know the answer, right? So, so show us your reasoning, that's the idea. So there's a hint for those that are taking that exam later on. Right, so, so we got um, thinking about this question, and Walter Block as well got thinking about this question. They presented this paper. Uh, I approached them after this conference and said, oh, you know, I, I wrote about this right, 14 years ago right, when I was a fellow. So they brought me in, and I added a little bit to the paper, not necessarily anything of substance, uh, but I at least know what the paper says. So, so a lot of this is based on right, that paper, so you can uh, look at that for more detail. Uh, I see that I think Dr. Herbner is not in the room. So if I wildly misrepresent something, you're going to have to tell him what I said first to double check that I'm not getting it wrong. Okay. All right, so my, my basic idea, so why are we talking about international business cycles? Uh, it's not just that international business cycles are a real thing that may actually have importance in themselves, uh, but it's that I believe that thinking about the international transmission of business cycles, how it is a business cycle can move right, from country A to country B, right, tells us something about the transmission of business cycles inside of any particular country. Right? So why is it that I have to suffer when I'm not the one that's out there borrowing money during the credit expansion? Right. I'm not the one that's getting involved with building houses during this housing boom. Yet nonetheless, right, I'm now facing consequences when the economy falls apart. Right. So how did that connection happen? Right, where I was not involved directly with the cluster of errors, but nonetheless I'm affected by it. Right, so we can learn something about domestic right, business cycle transmission by looking at these international business cycles as well. Okay. Right, so I want to start, though, uh, by looking at the data as a good Austrian economist. Right. So here we go. See if this works. Yes. Okay. I do not expect you to actually read this. Just look at the colors. <laughs> okay. So what I have here, this is a table of, I believe it's 20 fairly large economies. Uh, we're looking at anything from the United States, uh, Argentina's in there, right? South Africa as well. I think that's basically the range you get. So these fairly developed economies for the most part. Okay. All right, so, and what this is showing is the correlations right, in their business cycles. It's the deviation 
right, and their GDP from its underlying trend, so it gets some sense of what the business cycle is like, uh, and the correlation of that between countries. All right, so up here, anything that you see in green is a fairly strong correlation. Uh, for those who have taken statistics, it's a value of at least 0.5, right, 0.5 was the cutoff. Right, so there's a reasonably strong connection between these countries' business cycles. Uh, then anything in white is positive, right, so it's greater than zero, right, but it is less than 0.5. Right? And then the red means that it was less than zero. And so the lesson I want you to get from this is that there's a lot more green than red. Right? Right? And certainly if we take green and white together, right, so that where there's any kind of positive correlation leaning that direction, that vastly outnumbers right, the red that's there. Right? So it does look like international business cycles seem to be a thing. That is, we, we generally, though not always, right, tend to experience booms and busts together. Right? Okay. So that's something we need to think about as to why that may happen. So, but then we need to think about, okay, so we have this thing that is, seems to be a relatively common experience, right? but what, what is special and also what is not special right, about this international right, nature of things? In my mind, there's really nothing magical about a border right, that we would expect oh, on one side of a line or the economy is going to operate vastly differently than on the other side of a particular line. Right? So I think of, the, say, the U.S. and Canada, right? so, or rather the, U, the U.S. and the 51st state. Right? You wouldn't think this line really matters that much. We're both very similar economies in many ways. Yeah, okay, they have socialized health care where we don't quite. Right? We just have highly interventionist health care instead. Right? But for the most part, these economies look very similar. One would think that they would uh, act somewhat similarly. Right? So there's nothing particularly magical right, about the borders. But what does matter is the fact that we have different legal institutions. Right? And among these legal institutions is money. Right? Canada uses the Canadian dollar, right? we use the American dollar. Right? And that can create differences potentially between these economies and the way that the economies work in terms of the business cycle. As you know, and as has been emphasized all the way through from Dr. Klein's first talk on money all the way down, right? money has an impact when we talk about business cycles. Different monies may mean different business cycles. Right, so that's why borders would matter, because they matter because of this legal basis that then right, changes what, the way the monetary system works. Okay. So now let's get into inter international business cycle transmission. Okay. So I first want to lay out kind of the traditional story, right, which played a big role as Mises was putting together his own business cycle theory. It's the specie flow mechanism. It's so the basic idea here is that we have two countries so these two countries here, they operate on the same commodity reserve. So say they both have a gold-based money. Right? But they have different paper monies pyramided on top of this. Right? So both of these are operating, potentially, I guess we'd say, not very well, and creating more paper money than they actually have gold to back it. Right? So what then happens? Right? Well, suppose that we have right, these, these two different countries. Right? One of them is, say, being relatively well-behaved at the moment. The other one is being less well-behaved and is increasing the amount of paper currency out there. Right, so we have an increase in the amount of fiduciary media right, in, say, let's just call it country A. So what happens? Right. Well, we know that some of this money is going to be used in trade. Right, so we would start buying right, more goods right, from the country next door. Right. As our paper currency flows over to the country next door to country B, right, they don't really want paper right, from country A. Right, so they take that paper, right, they redeem it right, for gold. Right. So gold flows from the more inflationary country to the less inflationary country. Which means now that country A is in a more precarious position. Right? They've printed a bunch of paper. Now their gold that was backing it is leaving. This is potentially going to be a problem. Right? So seeing this, they cut back right, on how much money they're producing. And this would then create a cyclical effect in that economy. Right? As we see through, um, say, Austrian business cycle theory would explain this. Right? Increase the amount of money, people are out there spending more, the piece of credit markets, we get these distortions, stop this increase, interest rates go back up, right? Everything has to correct. All right. And so that would be where this comes from, and this is kind of the original, uh, part of the original inspiration, right, for Mises. Mises taking this idea of the specie flow mechanism, saying this applies not just internationally, but also to different banks, right? As they're operating within a particular country, we'd have the same kind of effects, potentially, right? and that would then lead to create these problems with the um, capital structure. And so Mises made that connection as well. So bring it dom domestic first, and then also connecting with the capital structure. Okay. All right, so then what do Bloch, Herbner, and Engelhardt bring then to the table? Right? What exactly did we do? Right. Well, really the question goes back to Dr. Herbner's question. 
suppose that we have these two nations again, but the one is actually doing things totally right. right? right, right. Holding to that gold-backed currency, right? maintaining that 100% ratio so they're not worried about this. Would we still, still see right, a transmission of business cycles between these two countries? Okay. Well, we point to four different effects right, that could potentially lead to this transmission. Right? That could lead to wow, right, these, these green spots right, that we see on my heat map there. Okay, so the first effect is an interest rate effect. Right? Well, it turns out interest rates in one country right, could affect interest rates in another country right, simply through arbitrage. Right? The fact that when I'm investing, I'm not stuck investing in the United States. We live in this international world. If I see good investments in Canada, right, then I'm going to invest in Canada. Right? So what happens when we have this increase in the money supply, say, in the United States? Right? Well, we know interest rates are falling here. Right? That means that if I'm doing things like buying bonds, for example, not looking as good in the United States. Right? Relatively, now looking better everywhere else. Right? So we'll see this investment right, flow out of right, the inflationary country and into these other countries. Right? And they will also see very similar interest rate effects there as there's now a new supply of credit being provided ultimately right, by that inflationary country. Pump up our money supply, interest rates fall, so investors start investing elsewhere. So this would be the interest rate effect. Now, to give some evidence that this may actually matter, right? Okay, so here I have uh, first, these are the countries that have the closest correlation with the American economy. Uh, I think a lot of them would not be that surprising, in particular the top two, uh, the UK and Canada, where we have very close uh, connections with them in terms of our business cycles. Uh, Taiwan, I was a little bit surprised that one was quite so high up. We trade a lot with them. Uh, then Australia and the Netherlands are somewhat weaker, but still relatively strong with the United States. Now let's look at where we have the heaviest investment flow linkages. Right, so here we're looking at investment flowing right, either from the US to this country or vice versa. Right, so we have that, that path right, that we just described. Right? Investors taking money either from here or from there and then passing the other way. Right? This would tend to make our interest rates have to move the same direction. Right? So these are the five that have the heaviest investment flow linkages with the United States. And we see top two right, should feel familiar. Right? exact top two that we saw before. Right? Okay, right, so it looks like right, this connection is actually something that we do see and very well may be and logically would lead to this type of connection we see. Uh, the other three, what the, these numbers are here, those would be the correlations between business cycles. All right, so when we look at Germany, Luxembourg, and France, right, these are all fairly closely connected. They don't quite hit that 0.5 with the exception of Luxembourg, uh, but still fairly closely connected, certainly positively connected right, with the American economy. Okay. So there may be other things offsetting. All right, and so interest rate effects would be the first one. I would suggest this is also something that we can certainly apply inside the economy. And in fact, this is, I would suggest, the way that we believe that modern monetary policy actually works, right? The Fed, after all, is not providing money for mortgages most of the time, right? Yet, when they're pumping money into the federal funds market, which, which is, you think about it, like, it's kind of weird that the overnight like loan market would be what they're worried about, right? This overnight lending between banks. We're worried about that interest rate. That's the important one, right? Yet nonetheless, we know when they affect that, right, that affects everything else, right? So down goes the target interest rate, then down go mortgage rates, up goes the target interest rate, up go mortgage rates, right? Well, why does this happen? It's because of these different investments we can look at, right? One of them looks relatively bad, right? We start investing in other things, right? That's true internationally. It's also true domestically. And this is how we can tie different interest rates together, even within an economy. So that's the first effect. Second effect, right? income and wealth effects. Right? So one, one thing that we uh, know would happen is when we have a boom in a country, right? people tend to feel wealthier doing, during that boom. Right? So oh, all right, the housing market's going crazy here in 2006. I'm feeling great. Right? So what do I want to do? I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy more stuff. Perhaps even I'll take out a second mortgage so I can buy that stuff. Maybe, right? It's just a, a great idea, right? But, or nowadays, the stock market's doing so great, right? So, ah, right, I feel really good about that. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy more stuff, right? That I otherwise may not have bought. Well, when we buy that stuff, right, some of it's going to be from abroad, right? right so when I buy this other stuff, some of this will be imported from, say, Canada, China, Mexico, the UK or Japan, in the United States case. These would be our five heaviest trading partners. Right. So 
as we buy this stuff, what happens? Well, now we see an increase in demand right, for these goods that we're selling to the Americans that are increasing their money supply. Right? That leads then to a boom in the exporting, in the exporting countries, in those exporting industries, right, as they're then selling to us. Right? When things then reverse here at home, the stock market crashes, housing market crashes, and so on, we don't buy as much stuff, demand for their goods falls, right? and then they would experience the negative effect right along with us. Right? Okay, so here we have those heaviest trading partners. Again, we see Canada and the UK right, are on that list as well. Right? Fairly strong connections here. Interesting to me, though, is that when you look at the other three, the correlations between us and them in terms of the, um, the, the correlation of the business cycle is not as strong right, as we saw for the financial linkages. Right? Right? So that would suggest to me uh, that here I'm trying to use right, empirics the way that I think Austrians should. So let me comment on that. So why do we look at the data at all? Right? Okay. It's not to do theory. Right? I think it establishes a couple things. Right? One would be, right, why do I bother showing you this first thing? Right? Right? This proves it's a question worth asking. Right? Okay. Okay. If this entire thing were read, that would be really weird. That might require an explanation. But saying, oh, we need to explain why we have business cycles together would be the wrong question, because we don't. Right? Okay. Yeah, it reminds me of, I think it was last year at Mises U, somebody asked a, a question in one of the panel sessions. Right? Dr. Gordon gave one of my favorite answers I've ever heard to a question. Right? He said, I'd think more about that question if it were worth thinking about. <laughs> Which is just a great answer, right? right? So th this is to prove this is a question worth thinking about, right? So I think that is one point where we could actually use data validly. So yeah, this is something that actually happens. We might want to possibly explain it, right? I, or here, sometimes we have more than one explanation. We're not quite sure which one is the stronger one. Right? So in that case, the data can help sort this out. Right? The logic tells us the connection would be there. Right? How important the connection is, the logic doesn't necessarily tell us that. Right? Okay. All right, so that's where I'm using the data here. Okay. All right, but don't worry, this is the last one. <laughs> All right, so we do see that there is some kind of connection. This is generally positive, though not necessarily as strong right, as the financial linkages. We'll get to some reasons why that might be the case here in a second. Okay. All right. So first, right, interest rate effects. Second, income and wealth effects. Now, do income and wealth effects also affect us domestically? Yes, right. That's, it's fairly obvious, right? So, like me as a, a college professor, uh, although I'm affected a little bit differently than most industries, uh, generally speaking, uh, college is often countercyclical, right? So, so what happened, at least in our area uh, where I live? So, okay, we have this big construction boom. Suddenly, nobody wants to go to college. It's like, you can earn more, right? But, but I get a job now without having to pay you for four years and taking lower, like, lower paying jobs that I actually have time to go to school and this kind of stuff. Eventually, you'll get paid more is, is, not, is not a very strong argument, right? But then when the economy collapses and people don't have anything else to do, <laughs> they want to go back to college. Hey. And, and because I work at a state university at one of their branch campuses, we can say we give a cheap education. So, so it doesn't matter that you're unemployed. It's cheap, right? So there we go. And yeah, it's true. We hit like all kinds of enrollment records, right? Uh, as the recession was really bad and unemployment was high. Right? Uh, now as things are correcting, and now we're really worried about enrollment. So, all right, but I'm not worried. I keep telling all my colleagues, give it till the end of the year. <laughs> things will be better in 2020, most likely for us, which that means something else for the rest of you. <laughs> okay. right, but these income wealth, wealth effects do, of course, happen, right? And then they do affect not just those of us that are weird and countercyclical, uh, but the rest of you too. After all, when there's this construction boom, it's not just right, that we have, on the one hand, people's houses are worth more, they're gonna spend more on everything, right? They'll, I don't know, they'll buy more swimming pools or what have you, right? So that, that industry has helped and so on. Uh, but we also have right, the people that are working in those booming industries that now have a lot more demand are earning a lot more doing it. Right? So the construction workers, for example, right, are earning a lot more, they're spending a lot more, and that's trickling out through the economy. Yeah, you kind of hate saying that because it makes you sound like a Keynesian, but ripple effects happen, okay? All right, it's not totally wrong all the time, I suppose. Okay. All right, so these wealth and income effects, we see it both domestically and also internationally. Okay. Now, another effect, and this is one is more, much more specifically uh, international, right? and that is exchange rate effects. Okay. Right, so, suppose you have a monetary expansion here in the United States, hypothetically. 
Okay. What does that do then to the value of the dollar right, versus other currencies? Okay. Now, I know me, uh, I always found exchange rates out, out, outrageously confusing right, as a student because it's something where you can't say, does the exchange rate go up or down? Right. Okay, in what terms? So we're talking about dollars per peso or pesos per dollar. Right? They're going to move in opposite directions. I don't know which way you're stating the thing, so up and down. Either one could be right or wrong. Or maybe they're both right, depending on which of these you're talking about. So it's very confusing. So I think of the value of the dollar. All right, that's what we have in mind, so that should pin it down. So what happens to the value of the dollar if we print a lot more dollars? It's naturally going to decline. Right? If the rest of the country is not doing that, and the rest of the countries right, are not doing this, right, then they will see relatively right, the value of their currencies increase. And so what does this do uh, then for the United States? Okay. So if the dollar is worth substantially less right, than it used to be internationally, right, that means if I buy some, something from another country, it just got a lot more expensive. Right? Because if the dollar is not worth as much, I need more of them right, to buy the same thing as before. And this is happening right through exchange rates adjusting. Right? So my dollar is not worth as many Canadian dollars as it used to be. Now I need more American dollars to buy anything from Canada. Forget it, I'm not gonna buy as much from Canada. Ah. Now we're explaining this 0 0.18, 0 0.39, 0 0.24 being relatively low, right? Because we have a couple effects right, happening at the same time. One would be, right, say focus on China. So here in the US, we have this boom, right? So we want to buy more stuff, right? This includes stuff from China. On the other hand, right, we have this boom and our currency is losing value relative to the Chinese currency, assuming that they let that happen. Right? Well, that means all these Chinese goods are looking more expensive, so we don't want to buy as much from China. Right? So these two effects right, work against each other right, when we look at the, the international transmission of business cycles. So this exchange rate effect actually goes in many ways the opposite direction. Right? It would actually help explain negative correlations right, rather than positive ones. Okay, so we're not going to import as much. That, that's going to hurt other countries. Right? So our benefit right, would be their loss. And as far as that is a strong effect. How strong is the effect? Right. Generally, not the dominant one. Okay. Right, but this would, I think, help explain why we see right, so much white here. Right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I really would encourage you at some point right, to, to pull up something like this data and look at the negative ones because some of them are really interesting and some of them are really puzzling, right? So uh, just to list one that I can see from here, Mexico and Brazil, right, are one of the red combinations. Okay. Try to imagine, right, why that would be the case, right? That when Mexico is doing well, Brazil is doing poorly and vice versa. I don't have a good story for that, but it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. Maybe a question I should ask in the oral exam. <laughs> All right, so these exchange rate effects will work against right, the income and wealth effects, which I think is part of why we see right, right, the relatively weak uh, connections if we're really just looking at trade partners. Okay. Uh, a fourth channel right, would be the credit channel. Right, so well, what happens here, this actually goes back in some ways, but not quite, but it's similar to the specie flow mechanism, except it operates differently under the system we have. I suppose now that we have an expansion uh, here in the United States, right? and there are other countries that use the dollar as a basis for their reserves, right, for their banking system. This would be, say, the way the Bretton Woods system worked. Okay. All right, so in that case, we expand credit. Right? These dollars flow abroad. Right? Rather than them flowing back, though, now they serve as the basis of reserve currency, as, as reserves right, for these foreign currencies, okay. which then allows right, more credit to be created right, in these other countries. Right? So, we're piling up additional credit there as well. Right, so this credit channel right, is another way that we can see right, a connection between countries and as far as other countries rely on right, that expanding country's currency as a basis for reserves, or perhaps they use it themselves. Uh, I think of, for example, Ecuador right, as this dollarized economy. Right? They use the American dollar there. If we expand dollars here, some of them flow to Ecuador, they experience the boom as well, just because they're using our currency. So this would be another case where borders may not matter all the time. What matters is the money side of it. You've adopted our money side. You're basically in our borders as far as monetary disturbances will go. Okay. All right, so this would be a, a final channel. Now, I do want to comment, uh, I guess, okay, is that one that would operate inside, inside of, say, the United States? Well, sure, right? and as far as our banking system, right, uses common reserves, which we know it does, right? So, so this is something that would operate inside of an economy. So pretty much we have three out of the four, right, operate not just right, internationally, but also domestically. 
Now, the exchange rate effect really doesn't work domestically because we use the same currency, no exchange rate effect. So I think those are really the four channels for international um, transmission of business cycles. Uh, but I want to talk about one more kind of experience that we've had. And that is balance of payments crises. I find these really fascinating uh, because they pull in right, so many of these insights that we can get right, from thinking of things in an Austrian way and looking at how intervention can really distort right, how things work and create, with, create just total disasters. Okay, so the way balance of payments crises typically will play out, uh, I'll look at the 1990s Asian crisis as an example, right, is that we have right, some other country right, is tying or pegging right, their currency to, to a different country. Right? And something goes wrong where that's not the right, right exchange rate, right? and we have to do something to try to fix it. Right, so let's look at, uh, for example, the Asian crisis. Right, at this point in time, in order to aid trade right, with, say, the United States, specifically, right? a lot of Asian countries were pegging their currencies to the dollar. Right? Yeah. Why does that make trade easier? Well, if I'm going to have a long-term contract, then I, I know how much I have to pay in dollars for whatever I'm buying from you. Right? You can keep using your home currency, we can use the dollar. We don't have to worry about this uncertainty that maybe the value between the two is going to change. Right? Right, so this helps with things like trade. It also, and very importantly for Asia's case, right, helps with things like investment. Right. I don't have to worry about the fact that, say, when I make this investment in your country, when I build a factory, say, or when I buy stocks in Singapore or what have you, I don't have to worry about the fact that maybe your currency is going to lose a bunch of value, right? so I'm making a mistake right, in investing in your country where it would have been safer at home. Yeah. Right, so peg everything to the dollar. America is really important, so that's what we want to do. Right, and what happened? Well, it started out this way. Right? A bunch of money right, then moved from America right into, especially Southeast Asia, saw a lot of this, but also stretching up through Korea. Okay. We're very excited about the Asian tigers and all the growth that we saw happening in these economies. Right? This looks like a great opportunity, and this happened during the 1990s when interest rates had gotten fairly low. Uh, at the time, at the time, basically historical lows. Right? So if money has to flow abroad, because that's where the high return is, right? Investing domestically does not look like it's a great opportunity. So money is flowing abroad. Right? And these Asian economies very happily accepted it. We see lots of money right, flowing into them, lots of growth happening in terms of investment in capital and, and so on. But then what happened? Well, it turns out, like pretty much every economy on the planet, right, these economies had fractional reserve banking systems. They also had very close connections. This, I know this is going to be a shock to you. There is a close connection between the political system and the banking system. You almost never see this. That was a lie. <laughs> you basically always see this, right? And, but you especially saw this here. You had things like, oh yeah, my, my cousin is right, the legislator and I'm the one running this bank, right? So, so there was an expectation, right, that if things went wrong at these banks, that there would be right, bailouts coming. I don't know, that, that would, certainly would not be the case in the United States. We don't bail out our banks. No. That, that's, a, that's a lie, right? <laughs> we do it on a regular basis. Okay. Anytime we have a chance, we bail out a bank. Right? Except Lehman Brothers, it's the one exception that I can think of. Right. Right. So, so there's this expectation of bailouts, and well, what happens? Right. Well, if I'm expecting to be bailed out, right, I'm going to make all kinds of risky investments. Right. After all, if things go well, I keep the money. If things go poorly, I get money from my friend in the legislature. It doesn't really matter. Right. So this would be the case of you know, if my rich uncle decides that he's going to you know, front all the money for me to go to Vegas. Right. Now I'll cover your losses. All right. I'm going to spend a lot of time at the craps tables, right? It doesn't matter that the odds are against me. I know the odds are against me because they built that casino somehow. Right? But there are people that win, and maybe it's me, right? Yeah. That's all it takes, right? Covering the losses by somebody else, right? I have the opportunity to gain, so we make all kinds of risky bets. And it turns out risky bets often don't pay off. In fact, on average, they don't pay off. That's the way casinos work, and that was, it turns out, what happened here. And we can explain that right, through Austrian business cycle theory. Right. We know that when interest rates fall, we're going to make all of these various investments that won't make sense when interest rates rise again. And that is exactly what happened. Right? As interest rates start rising right, in the United States, interestingly, where the money came from, right, money starts flowing out of these economies, right, which is creating serious problems in their banking systems. Right? As these banks start to go belly up, right, suddenly American investors are becoming more and more nervous about the state of things right, throughout Southeast Asia. And because Americans are notoriously bad at geography, right, we don't realize that, say, Thailand and Indonesia are totally different countries. 
So, so okay, Thailand is having problems, right? We're pulling money out of there. Oh, we also need to pull out of, out of Indonesia and out of Korea and what's so, and so on. These are all these are all Asian countries. They're basically the same. At the time, uh, it, it, this actually reminds me of a quote from Ronald Reagan back during the Latin American crisis, which played out somewhat similarly. Um, yeah, he was watching are these countries fall and investors pulling out, and he said, "But." but they're all different countries. I seems very confused about the fact right, that they were being treated the same way by international investors. But we saw this happen again right, in the 1990s with the Asian crisis. Of course, as money leaves, right, now the banking system is even in more trouble. Okay. But let's compound that with something else happening. And here we get to the international side of it even more. What's happening in exchange rate markets? Uh, we're trying to peg things to the dollar. Now, when there are a bunch of dollars flowing in, what does that do? Right? Well, there's an increased demand for our home currencies. Right? It's going to trend, tend to push up their value. Right? Well, we don't want that to happen. We want this to stay steady. It turns out it's very easy if you're producing a paper currency to drop its value. You, just, you print more, right? create more of the thing, right? increase the supply, right? the value is going to fall. Right? So it wasn't a problem when investors are trying to throw a bunch of money into these Southeast Asian countries. Just increase the money supply, right? and that will keep the exchange rate pegged. It becomes much more of a problem when it goes the other direction. So now money is being pulled out. Right? People are selling off all of these home currencies to get back into dollars. Propping up the value of the currency is very difficult. Right? So they found that they couldn't do it. Right? So we you know, had to swallow very hard and accept that the value of these currencies was going to fall. As an investor, how does that make you feel? Right? Things get faster and faster. Right? So we have these crises that happen internationally uh, in part because we have these paper currencies we're trying to peg together, right? two actually different currencies, trying to treat them as if they're equivalent to each other when they're not. Right? And that created additional issues. Right? Uh, in the case of the Asian crisis, you can also look back in the 1980s, uh, the Latin American crisis, we saw a very similar story play out. Okay. Right? So we have these issues right, that show up time and time again, where there are these international connections right, that create the transmission of business cycles, and sometimes when we make particularly bad policy moves, actually lead to these things getting even worse right, than they otherwise may have been. Right. So is there something we can do? Right? So back to that question, right? right? Is the virus of macroeconomic interventionism contagious? We've just answered yes. Right? We have a few ways that it will be. But is there some way we can inoculate ourselves? Right? Is there some kind of vaccine we can take that will protect us right, from these viruses that are around us? Well, it turns out the answer is also yes. Right? Now, in the extreme case, right, we cut off all economic connections with anybody else. If I don't want to experience America's business cycle anymore, I run off into the woods, right, build myself a little shack, and try to live off of the land. Right? So that means for, for at least five or six days, I will not experience the American business cycle, and then I'll die. <laughs> but I will not experience the business cycle in that time. Now, this might be more possible, and our president certainly hopes that it's possible, uh, if, say, you have a whole country that's doing this, just cutting off our connections to the outside world uh, in terms of trade, in terms of investment. Right? So, say we, we do this in the form of capital controls, right? so we do not allow outside investment in, do not li allow Americans to invest abroad, right? cut off that credit connection, which we know is very important. Right? We can also cut off the trade connection. Right? Right? So, it's not that hard to set a quota of zero for, for any kind of imports. Right? So we don't import, we also won't, won't export because that also makes us uh, vulnerable. Right? So just no trade right, outside of our country, no investment outside of our country, that will insulate us right, from all of these effects. I hope you'll know I'm not advocating that. <laughs> there are negative effects from this as well, as we know that trade is actually beneficial. Right? Like, there's a reason that I live in society, and even though, yes, I could get fired by my university if they decide that tenure isn't good enough, they want to get rid of me anyway, yes, I'm vulnerable to this, but at the same time, I'm going to be a lot better off right, trying to interact with the rest of society than isolating myself just to avoid a business cycle. Right? So cutting off all economic connections feels like it would be a bit much. So then we, lead to, we then lead to the the ultimate conclusion of our paper, that is, does domestic discipline help at the very least? Right? Like if we are right, that, that country B in the hypothetical scenario where we're holding right, to sound money, we're not inflating the currency, we are not expanding credit like, domestically, right? like we'll still experience some of these effects. Uh, but what we suggest, right, that's Block, Herbert, and I, is that all of these effects will be dampened 
right, to some degree, or in some cases shut off entirely. Right, so for example, let's do the easy one, the credit channel. Remember the credit channel said that you know, if, say, if I have, if I'm producing a currency that's your reserve currency or we're connected in this reserve currency sort of way, right, then we can end up with credit expansion. Well, in this case, if we're not expanding credit in the first place, it doesn't matter how much reserve we have. It, it doesn't really matter, right? Like, plus, if we're on a gold standard, we're not using your currency as a reserve either, right? So both ways, this is not going to uh, create a connection. So the credit channel is totally shut off. Yeah. Now, the others, though, could still be there to some degree. However, uh, we, we pointed out a few, uh, few issues, right? right? One being, if we're not expanding credit as well, right, that's going to tend to dampen any uh, potential interest rate effects. Like it's only going to be the money coming from abroad right, that is going to create any interest rate effect at all. We're not piling on top of that. Right. And then we have these income and wealth effects and exchange rate effects. We know that these tend to offset each other to some degree. Right. So those will naturally right, tend to dampen. Right. So we've dampened the big effects. Right. And then the others tend to naturally seem to dampen each other to some degree at the very least. We pointed to another effect right, that we think would be beneficial. Right. And that is that if we know that we are well-disciplined, then the exchange rate starts to provide more information than it does under our current system in the world we live in. Right? Because it allows us to identify right, where the distortions are coming from right, in a way that's very difficult to do, say, domestically. Right? Like, like it's obvious to me, say, as a business cycle theorist, obviously we must be living in some kind of boom economy that's going to fall apart probably, I suspect, right, within a year. Right? Where's the boom? I... I, I, I honestly don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. It's hard for me to identify. Right? Because at the same time, it might be that some industries are just genuinely doing well as others are being artificially inflated. I can't really tell the difference. But what exchange rates then allow us to do, we can look around the world, right, if, if we can trust the value of our money because it is sound, because we're not inflating, because we're not expanding our credit, right? we can trust that value. So when we watch, say, oh, right, this country over here, country A, it suddenly saw a big drop in the value of its currency, we can identify that they must be inflating. Right? And we can take this into account as, say, uh, entrepreneurs in our country are making decisions. Right? Right? So, like, do I want to get involved in an industry that's exporting a bunch to country A? Well, they want to import a lot from me, but I will take into account, maybe I will anyway, right? but I'll know that this is a temporary thing. Right? They have created an artificial boom if I'm hopping in to export to them, I am also on borrowed time. Right? Maybe I decide it's worth it, right? Right? but I can make that judgment and make it much more in an informed way. Right? I know exactly where the distortions are coming from. And we suggest that in this way, entrepreneurs will make better decisions. Right? Right? So if we think of Austrian business cycle theory, as Dr. Howden described, as really being about a cluster of errors, Better information, allowing us to identify where things are coming from, allowing us to plan accordingly, will tend to see fewer errors than made by our, by our entrepreneurs as we've provided them with good information they can then use. Right, so we suggest that for those reasons, like one being just dampening the effects, the other being this informational role right, that is new if we have an actually well-behaved country. Right, because of those two things, we do think that we can perhaps not inoculate ourselves, but there's a sort of domestic medicine we're providing right, that will help protect us from some of the worst effects that could potentially happen. Okay. So let me finish up then with just what I hope are the key takeaways. Uh, first, that is that business cycles transmit right, through these four effects. That is interest rate effects, wealth effects, and the credit channel, and then we have these exchange rate effects offsetting. Right. Now when we're going across currency areas is where we see that. Now the first three effects though, that is interest rate, wealth, and credit channel, these are things that operate not just internationally, but also domestically. They add to our understanding of how our domestic economy works. Okay. But a second point, which I didn't emphasize much, but I think it's worth pointing out, is that in the world as it exists today, right, identifying the source of a crisis is not easy. Right? If there's international transmission, it might be that things are bad in the US, not because we inflated, but because Europe did. And I actually, I'm one, I think that there is some evidence that when you look at a lot of the housing boom and what central banks are doing at the time, uh, it, it appears, at least to me, that the European Central Bank was being significantly more inflationary than the Federal Reserve was. Right? Right, so there might be some degree to which we're victims of what's happening elsewhere. Right? But it's hard to tell that right? when everybody's inflating just to different degrees at the same time. Okay. So the source of the crisis could be from anywhere, potentially. Okay. 
And that makes it difficult and gives us some room to do some analysis. And uh, the final point would be the same proposals, right, that we as Austrians would hold, right, for domestic monetary policy, right, would also help, right, to contribute to international stability, right? It's not just, right, the domestic disturbances that we're avoiding, we're also dampening these international as well. In that case, thank you very much.